the whole idea of building a, a system for strength and conditioning for the fighting man is uh, to be complete. I've always had something in me when I set my mind on something like I, I won't stop. Hey guys, this is James Pratt with Wild Hunt Conditioning. We're a company that focuses on strength conditioning specific to the fighting man. I myself used to fight, I uh, still occasionally grapple, run ultra marathons, and uh, I bow hunt bear in the mountains. And uh, today we're going to be taking a look at something we did this spring where I completed my uh, somewhat long time goal of deadlifting over 500 pounds and running 50 miles in the same day. I hope you enjoy. So you might be wondering why someone would want to lift uh, more than 500 pounds and run 50 miles in the same day. And uh, the truth is I don't, at least coming into this, I didn't have any real long-term background in powerlifting or ultra marathon running. I had run uh, one organized ultra marathon and two solo ultra marathons before this, just uh, as a personal test. But I've always been drawn to extreme feats of will. Um, my dad was a bear hunter, so I spent my early years running around the mountains with him and other bear hunters, and I became fascinated with uh, the feats of strength, endurance, and uh, quite frankly, pain tolerances that I saw in these men, and it really influenced my, uh, my idea of masculinity. Through a discussion with a friend, I realized that there weren't really, I'd never seen anyone do anything like this as far as combining the strength and endurance, at least to this degree. It immediately kind of appealed to me. And then later I realized that it would be a good opportunity to show what the wild hunt system was capable of. And generally when approaching that, it was, uh, it was tempting to just get very specific in training and focus on just getting really good at deadlifting and really good at running ultra marathons. But the whole idea of building a system for strength and conditioning for the fighting man is uh, to be complete. And the best way to survive a hostile environment or intense pressures is to be complete and strong and not have a bunch of vulnerabilities or weak points. So in general and in training for this, we focused on training the full spectrum, strength, endurance, mobility, speed, athleticism, durability, and really just treated it more as if we were getting dropped off on a, a hostile planet or something as opposed to just coming into a simple test of strength or endurance. We achieved this primarily by focusing on proper mechanics, obviously in all of the main lifts and addressing them with high intensity but low volume, typically step three sets of three, four sets of two, low volume, followed by supporting accessories that you would do to help armor your joints and some of these problem areas, especially paying special attention to the ones that we're going to see a lot of uh, wear and tear during the run portion. Um, and then we would follow this with a lot large doses of GPP or what they call general physical preparedness. That's building general work capacity. So sleds, farmers carries, wheelbarrows, zercher carries, um, all sorts of exercises of this nature. And then we would sprint once a week, we would run long once a week, and we would ruck once a week. Um, earlier in the program we ran a little bit more but the volume as it got higher would come down to a single long run per week. So there was no daily runs, we weren't logging 100 miles per week, it was just me running anywhere from 10 to 20 up to 30 miles in a single session while also sprinting on another day and rucking on another day. And we used all of these sessions as symbiotically as possible. So one session would help us recover from the next session. For instance, if we had a heavy squat day one day, then the next following day it would be a ruck and uh, while that would help us build strength and uh, work capacity and help armor our joints, it would also help in encourage active recovery. And uh, so we tried to organize this as symbiotically as possible. And uh, honestly, we didn't really have to alter much from the original Wild Hunt system as it was built primarily to do broad spectrum or built primarily for broad spectrum applications like this. So it really required very little adaptation. Because of my background in martial arts, I, uh, I was definitely more comfortable with cardio output and I had obviously run three ultra marathons coming into this. So I wasn't as concerned with the uh, accomplishing the ultra marathon portion. Um, however, I had never power lifted and never really tried to develop the deadlift specifically. 
Um, I had done it as part of overall strength conditioning programs in an athletic context um, for grappling, for MMA, but I had never become very specific and tried to learn all the proper mechanics to the point that I could deadlift uh, three times my body weight, which was about what it came out to. As of the time, I was weighing about 181 pounds or so. And uh, we ended up pulling uh, exactly 520 pounds. So uh, I was more concerned with that. But it really came down to just a consistent application once it learned the proper mechanics. Uh, consistent application, you know, three sets of three was our, was our baseline. We would peak, you know, up into maybe nine to ten singles once every month, six, you know, six weeks or so. Really, I, I knew that it, just with consistent application, the strength would come. So I continued to maintain my cardio output and I uh, developed the strength and continued to be as well-rounded as possible. I also peppered in small uh, prehab sessions with bands for stuff, particularly on the ankles and hamstrings, uh, areas that I knew would encounter a lot of uh, repeated you know, force input throughout the whole day. And uh, really I just had, uh, had faith that once you, know, once you build a good system and you stick to it, that it's gonna get you where you wanna go. Okay, how important was it to you to accomplish this goal? Um, I was willing to die to do it. I, uh, I'm not being melodramatic, but I, I've always had something in me and it just went like, when I set my mind on something like that and I promised myself that I'm going to do it, I, I won't stop. And, uh, so with this, I knew that I, I just, I would accept nothing less. And, uh, it was important also to prove to myself that I could, because there was, you know, as with anything, there was parts of me that didn't. You know, I, I had voices in my head that were telling me, you know, I couldn't do it. I had doubts, I had insecurities, that maybe I wasn't as, as tough as uh, I thought I was, or maybe I had bitten off more than I could chew. And those voices just got louder and louder as, as it went on. But uh, I've, <laughs> I've never been very good at listening. So uh, defiance, I guess, is it's something that's given me a lot of problems in my life and, you know, led to a long history with crime and drug use. and. Uh, but in this context, it just uh, it, it was a, a strength because I refused to accept anything less. And uh, that came in very useful towards the end. Uh, around mile 38, I stopped to switch out my water or get fresh water and electrolytes and food. And I made the mistake of uh, sitting down to change out my socks and uh, my legs locked up pretty bad. So the last uh, you know, 12 miles or so were pretty brutal. And that was when, uh, that was when the the doubt started coming in more and I started wondering if I even could do this, but uh, I just, it's just, I kept reminding myself it's all you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. I mean, literally, as with everything else I've been through from getting clean to serving time to trying to rebuild my life, it's just, it's one foot and the other day after day. And this was no different, you know, as much as it hurts, as much as everything doesn't want to move and your mind fights against every step you take, at the end of the day, it's all it is. You're putting one, one foot in front of the other, step after step. And uh, sure enough, uh, across the finish line at, uh, was it two in the morning, three in the morning? I think we started we started at noon and, and uh, whatever 13 hours and 47 minutes later was, was when I finished. What do you think you learned about yourself doing 50 miles and a 500 pound deadlift in a single day? Honestly, I... <laughs> I was, it was a little anticlimactic. It felt amazing to do, but by the time that I had done it, I'd spent so much time working towards it that it, it seemed almost mundane. Like it just, it seemed like another, just another goal, you know, you goal you hit on the path to, you know, a fitness goal of any type. Um, but it also, it also made me, reminded me that we, we really are the ones that set our own limitations in anything we do. And it's just, if you set a goal and you, there's nothing to it, there's nothing special. It's just if you keep chipping away at that goal and you try to find better ways to keep chipping away at that goal, there's very little you can't do over time. How did you eat leading into this day? And then how did you eat the day of? So in the days leading up, the 72 hours leading up, I obviously tried to carb load and get, you know, make sure I was, I was in a nice caloric surplus. Um, the day of coming uh, here to super training for the, uh, the deadlift portion, uh, I really just ate like I normally would. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to try to do anything my body wasn't used to or shove anything crazy in me. Um, in the morning I get up, I make a smoothie with some greens, some yogurt, you know, a little bit of protein and, you know, some fruit. 
and uh, and then I have you know a couple Aussie bites or something like that, and I come in and train, and that day was no different. Immediately after, though, on the drive, so we conducted the uh, the deadlift portion here at Super Training right around noon, more or less. And from here, we drove straight out to Roseville, from which point I started and ran to Folsom Lake, around Folsom Lake, uh, Folsom, El Dorado Hills, and Granite Bay before returning to Roseville again. And before I set off on the drive from Super Training to Folsom Lake to set off, we, uh, we had pineapple and steak ready. So I ate most of a pineapple, probably two thirds of a pineapple and eight ounces of steak. And then I had my, uh, in my bag packed up from the beginning, I had uh, some tortillas with peanut butter and honey in them, like little burritos that I could eat as I was running, uh, several packets of electrolytes, a camel bag full of water, some medical supplies, some basic wet wipes and stuff. Um, and so I set out feeling really good. Uh, the one mistake I made initially was I wear, wore a new pair of shorts that created some weird chafing on the inside of one leg, like they had, they were, and some compression stuff built in. And so I, uh, I was like six miles in and my support team, uh, who for this one was just, uh, was just Janae, my, uh, my fiance, um, she had to come meet me, you know, meet me on the side of the road somewhere. And I had to strip naked in the back of her car and uh, change shorts and then get, get right back to it. But uh, after that, things, uh, things were nice. It was a beautiful day. Um, first weekend of March, so the weather was great here in California, and most of it was over trail. Uh, the trail I picked was a bit too rough in retrospect, maybe it was very steep, and a lot of it was rocky, so my feet were maybe a bit more torn up than they would have been, uh, especially as I wore a semi-minimalist shoe um, for this one uh, from a company called Topo Athletic that uh, I didn't have a lot of experience with, but I'd worn another pair of their shoes in training and uh, really enjoyed them because it was somewhat intermediate between your typical ultra marathon running shoe and a more minimalist shoe. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, I had a blast. I watched the, you know, the day pass, the sun went down and went deep into the night. And I was just, honestly, it was beautiful. Um, when you do these, or at least when I do these things, I, I tend to kind of get to this weird mental place. It's, I mean, it's somewhat psychedelic, but it's also just different. And I, I kind of, I've always equated it with kind of running with this one, one, one foot in this world and one foot in another world. And uh, I just, I just, I love that feeling. It's something that's serene and distant and peaceful. And uh, I got a large dose of it that night. And after I finished, uh, traditionally in the past, when I finished an ultra marathon, I'm, I'm too wired to sleep uh, that next night. So I might nap a little bit, 20, 30, 60 minutes, something like that, and then wake up. And about the time I wake up, when my body starts catching up with me, the, the pain in the joints, the feet, the muscles, uh, your hamstrings, calves, everything is just, it's like someone injected acid into them. They just lock up, they, it's weird. Sometimes they just won't even work. So I tried to eat what I could and I didn't have much of an appetite either. Everything was just kind of burned out. And, uh, but the next night I slept for 12 hours, which is twice what I normally sleep. And the day after that, I was I was eating cookies and all all sorts of goodness. Um, so I rebounded pretty well. It was about three days before I was like, you know, I could walk around pretty normally and train light. Um, but and then I was back to jujitsu. I think you know, like late, you know, less than a week later or whatever. But uh, and I did manage to train jujitsu through most of this period as well, just twice a week. Some days once a week. You know, it was very dependent on how my body felt. Um, I tried not to introduce anything to the equation that I didn't have some control of, so I tried to you know, moderate all the extras I put on top of that. The only things I would really do different going back specifically to the training and preparation was I would spend more time training my hamstrings at a shorter length, specifically uh, certain hamstring curls at certain angles that I, I could have addressed uh, better, and uh, maybe paid a little bit more attention to my right ankle because I had it uh, torn apart by a, a toe hold uh, last year, year before, anyway, in grappling. And um, that's about it though, no actual mechanical problems, just those were little weak points that I noticed lit up more than the rest of my body. But um, overall, preparation went great, the execution went great, and it, it was just an amazing experience. Okay, so you mentioned the trail was a little rougher than what you had initially thought it would be. Was there any other things that you would change if you could do it again? Or any mistakes that you feel like you made outside of that? I would have been safer probably in the way that I executed it. Generally, when you run an ultra marathon, you stop pretty frequently every couple miles or so, and uh, you check in, you know, you resupply anything you need. 
For this one, I only stopped twice over the period of 50 miles, um, and each just for a few minutes to switch out my stuff. Uh, so it was about around mile 15, and then what was it, you know, mile 38, I think. So I probably would have put some more, you know, more basic stops in there, and you're not getting any rest when you stop. You're stopping, switching your stuff, and you keep going. But it's good to, uh, you know, stay in touch, stay supplied, and then stay kind of emotionally connected to the, uh, you know, the people and the rest of the world. But um, so overall, I, I maybe I would have, I would have introduced a more, a little bit more structure to it. But um, you know, worried my fiance a little bit less. But other than that, I really, I really. Uh, I don't have any complaints and I, I don't mind you know stopping less over the course of a long run because I, uh, I like I mean I like being alone and that's that's a big part of the you know the solitude and the freedom is a big that's really what draws me to running more than anything so uh, I didn't mind it but it would have been safer uh, to probably have some more check-ins and a little bit more logistical support when you're at mile 30 and you're like thinking about giving up, what was the dialogue like in your head and what were you telling yourself in order to keep moving forward? So the dialogue kind of degrades and becomes less sophisticated with every mile after, you know, 30 or so. Um, I seem to have, based on prior experience, just a side note, I seem to really start to feel it about there and then around mile 40 I rebound hard and I get, you know, I get another surge of energy and focus. Uh, that did happen on this one as well, despite you know the uh, my my legs locking up after mile 38. But um, generally, it's you, you remind yourself why you're there because like, well, like anyone, it, you know, your brain's asking like, why am I doing this? What's the point? There's no, I'm not getting, I'm not making any money off this. I'm not getting any any fame or fortune. This is just you on a trail in the dark. You know what? What's the point? And. Uh, so you do kind of, you know, I mean, some of those thoughts do pop into your head, but I, I, they don't really have much currency with me because I don't, it's not that I don't feel them or I'm, I'm too tough to acknowledge them or anything like that, but those moments out there on the trail alone in the dark, that's why I'm there. It's not, those, for me, those are the, the, the benefit, not the cost. And so I did have a couple moments though when I was running along the Folsom Lake, the trail on Folsom Lake, and I, I came through a stretch where you could see uh, there's some very nice uh, homes up there and uh, they have faced the lake and a lot of them have big you know, glass windows covering the rear of their houses and I, I remember looking in, it was a Saturday night and there were families in there having dinner and they were laughing and it was cold and bright and warm and, uh, and I remember like feeling like something, just this weird little, a little slight pull on my heart, you know, kind of just like towards that comfort and that safety and that f familiarity and luxury and then I just remember it was just gone like, as quick as it came. It might've been 30 seconds. And, uh, and then I had almost, almost a feeling of sympathy for you know, for those people, not that they were doing anything wrong. There was anything wrong with them, but they weren't, they weren't going to feel what I was feeling. Like they, they couldn't understand that they were missing out. You know, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted them to be able to understand that. And I knew they wouldn't. And, um, and so that, you know, I knew that then that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. I haven't quite picked the next project yet, but I, I walk around kind of every day just with this feeling like there's there's something inside me that needs to be given, and uh, I want to I want to find more ways to do that for sure. But I don't uh, I don't know. There's there's a big reservoir of it in there, and it's just a matter of finding the next thing that I want to uh, I want to apply it to, and I haven't yet. But um, I mean, I just uh, I think that's that's the key to life. You got to live it, man. We're we're not going to be here, not going to be here for that long. Even if you live to 100, it's it's a blink, you know, it's a blink of an eye. So, I'd like to get out there and experience as much of that as I can, and make up for as much lost time as I can. I'm I'm not going to encourage everyone to go out there and try to do the same thing, but I, I would recommend that you know maybe people think about uh, think about something that would make them feel that same excitement because the feeling I get pursuing stuff like that and doing stuff like that is just it's it's. It surpasses even heroin by, you know, a margin too big to even describe. It, it's just something, something that fulfills you and speaks to you is it's priceless and it's rare in this world. So if you can find it and if you can think about it, I'd say chase after it with all the energy and time you have left. How would you compare the struggle of kicking your past drug abuse to the struggle of accomplishing this insane physical goal? Um, I mean, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a connection. Anyone who's uh, had like a long-term severe opiate addiction knows uh, probably more about suffering than, than most people. Um, 
but the truth is it's just that, that i mean it in one way i've just replaced one addiction with another um i it's just the feeling that i get from doing stuff like this is so far beyond anything i've felt on any drug ever and uh i uh i mean it helps the discipline that i you know that i built while incarcerated you know all, all i did over that time period was exercise and read and <clears throat> it, it taught me a lot about controlling your mind and uh not trying to control things beyond your control. I mean, when you don't have control over your meal times, your uh, your location, your freedom of movement, uh, your safety, oftentimes, it, I mean, you have to just kind of accept that all you can do is prepare and you forge yourself into something capable of surviving and resisting these situations. Um, and that honestly affects, I mean, inform the way that I, I train. I, I don't, I've never focused on, uh, you know, maybe a bodybuilding type mindset where you're, you're constantly breaking something down to rebuild something up. I've always thought of training more as acclimation, getting your body and your mind acclimated to these pressures so they can survive intense pressure, expectedly, unexpectedly, under controlled circumstances, uncontrolled. Um, so it, it really, I mean, I guess, yeah, all of it, all of it informs how I approach these things. And I mean, it's all tied together. We, a human is a, a complex web of feelings and memories and thoughts and ideas. and. So it's, uh, I mean, that all does come together, but you don't have to be a, an ex-con or an ex-heroin addict to, uh, to do anything like this. And it's, I mean, it's, it, there's certainly nothing special to it on my part. I'm a 35 year old hearing impaired ex-junkie. I got my uh, education. I graduated from high school with uh, credits from a correctional institute. Um, I'm completely natural and I have no special resources beyond anything else. It's just, it's just this consistent application of pressure to one thing. Well, I hope you find that useful, guys. If you have any questions about uh, the training process or anything linked to the motivation, please drop a comment below. And uh, we should be releasing a program before long that will uh, include, cover all of our training, uh, training practices, balances, and uh, really just be the blueprint to anyone else who wants to uh, deadlift three times their body weight and run an ultra marathon in the same day. So uh, if you guys like stuff like this, go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, and then check us out on social media.